You get benefits. Some of the benefits are that you you can, uh, if you run out of money, the diaconate can can you're 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 more eligible for getting money from our diaconate from the deacons, and uh, so but but the diaconate also gives funds to non-members too. So I mean there is there isn't a whole lot in terms of like here's what your here's your your member benefits package. Mostly membership is about like I said. You can now serve on a committee. You can serve in the nursery. You can teach Sunday school. You can teach a class like this. You can do coffee. You can be a greeter, parking lot guard. You can, you can now, you're opened up to serve the church. Uh, and then the other thing is you are now um, <clears throat> underneath the spiritual leadership of the church. We have um, a means to discipline you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it, if you're not a member of the church, and let's say, you know, Bob, I don't want to say Bob. Uh, I'm trying to pick a name that doesn't, isn't anyone in this room. Uh, uh, Fred. Fred. Fred is a, is a, goes to our church with his wife. They're not members. And we saw Fred really drunk the other day. And somebody said he keeps getting drunk. And then the neighbor said, I heard, I, I think I saw him beating his wife. Right. Well, we can do things to Fred. We can call the police and we can talk to Fred. But we can't actually discipline Fred. Uh, membership, if Fred were a member, we could say, Fred, if you keep this up, you keep beating your wife, we're going to bar you from the table. You are no longer going to be permitted to take the sacrament of communion, and that is going to be a visual uh, depiction to you of being severed from the body of Christ. Um, when Jesus says to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom, that's the way we look at this. The, the elders have been given the keys of the kingdom. Who's in the church? Who's not in the church? The elders have those keys. And so members are people who are in the body, and people we discipline, we say, you're no longer in the body. Christ has given that authority to the elders in order to be Christ to the church. Why? We don't want Fred running around beating his wife saying, glory be to Jesus, I'm a member of First Artesia. We're going to be like, no way, you're not a member here. You're living outside the life of Christ. Uh, we want to be able to, to um, distinguish between those who are Christians and those who are not. That might sound scary. It might sound like, oh man, it's like the Gestapo, and if I don't show up to church on Sunday, or if I post something bad on Facebook, the elders are going to come after me, and we're going to kick you out of the church. Uh, theoretically, that could happen. I, I, I almost never hear of that happening. The process that the elders go through to um, excommunicate, to bar someone from membership, it takes like years. It's a long process. We sit down with Fred. We have a lot of meetings with Fred. We sit down with his wife. It's month after month. We, we try as hard as we can to counsel and bring it back. Fred, please stop sinning against your wife. Please start serving Christ. Please, you know, it's a long, long process. But it's a process that the church must be able to enact. The church is not the church if the church does not uh, shepherd the flock of God. Right? If you go into... No offense, Saddleback, no offense to Saddleback, but you go in and you sit in this giant sanctuary with 5,000 other people. Nobody knows who you are. You could be a hatchet murderer and be there every single Sunday and nobody would know the wiser. That church is failing to exercise discipline. It doesn't, one sec, Joe, it doesn't mean that big churches are bad, but it does mean that uh, churches need to, need to know who the members are, and they need to have a relationship with the members. The elders have to have a, some sort of relationship. Otherwise, we could have hatchet murderers running around who are claiming to be Christians, and then when CNN comes and says, hatchet murderer, member of First Artesia, everybody's going to be like, I'm not going to become a Christian because Christians are hatchet murderers. You know, we have, the elders have a sovereign responsibility uh, given to us by God to protect the name of Christ. Right? We, we are here to, to say, like, Christ's name will not be slandered. Now, hatchet murderers can come in and visit and stuff. We, we don't check IDs at the door, but we do want to prevent um, people identifying sin with Christ. The church is supposed to be the body of Christ. It's supposed to be identified by him. And so the elders have this responsibility to say, hey, if you're not living like Christ, we love you. We want you to attend. We want you to be here. But we're, we, don't, we, we can't have you as a member because you're not, uh, you're not following Christ as far, as far as we can tell. Okay, that's why I titled this, this class Sanctification or Sadism, right? To a lot of people, that sounds like, man, why would I ever want to do that? 
I am a rugged individualist American. I like being the captain of my own destiny. You know, uh, I don't want to be under spiritual authority. That sounds bad. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, delivering a person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Yeah, there's a, there's a verse that's uh, in 2 Corinthians. Okay, so I got a big outline here. There's a lot we can talk about. I'm going to try to give you the highlights um, from, from this outline. Okay, so that's kind of my introduction. Sounds kind of depressing, like who would ever want to do this? Let me give you another depressing introduction. Uh, Billy Graham. We all know, does anybody not know who Billy Graham is? Oh, I hate when people say that. Does everybody know who Billy Graham is? Everybody know who Billy Graham is? Yes. Okay. B- Billy Graham is this guy who died in, what, 90s? He, he was a big TV evangelist. He would go to, like, Angel Stadium, and they'd pack out Angel Stadium. Every, every seat would be filled, and he'd stand in the middle of Angel Stadium and say, who wants to become a Christian? And people would come down and give their life to Christ. He was a, a, a traveling evangelist. You know, he would share the gospel with big crowds and yada, yada. Great guy. I don't have anything against him. But they asked, uh, they asked him, they said... Um, how many people, uh, this is actually from a different lesson, so I'm going to have to go off memory. Uh, I'm thinking of another story from Billy Graham. Okay, so, so they asked him, how many people, Billy, uh, actually are Christians? You've got thousands of people coming in Angel Stadium and all these stadiums around the country coming forward saying, I want to become a Christian. They said, how many people are actually Christians today? And Billy Graham said, I would guess 25%. He said, I would guess out of those thousands and thousands of people who came forward, I guess 75% are not walking with Christ today. That was his guess. Uh, and that's because, you know, they go forward, they make this decision for Christ, and then they don't have elders. They're not members of any church. They just kind of fall away by the wayside. And they studied the, the, these people, and they found out that the actual number is like 6%. 94% of the people who came forward we're not following Christ later. Why? They're not members of the church. They weren't part of a church. They went forward. They said, I want, to be, I want to follow Jesus. And then they went back to their life. And it was just like nothing ever changed. That's the importance of church. Billy Graham himself gave this story. He said he was, uh, he was on a plane. And this man was making this ruckus. He was getting drunk on the plane. And he was you know, making inappropriate advances towards the stewardesses and shouting and screaming and making this big thing, and it was so bad that they couldn't take off on the plane. And um, finally, they, uh, for some reason, somebody kind of nudged him and said, you're a pastor, get up there and do something about this guy. And so Billy Graham goes up, and he's like, okay, I guess I should say something to this belligerently drunk man. And he goes up, and he says, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And the man looks at him and says, hey, aren't you Billy Graham? And Billy says, yeah. And he says, hey, I'm one of your converts. Right. So Billy tells that story himself. He told that story. You know, so it's like, okay, we, we have this big thing where everybody comes forward and like, I'm going to give my life to Christ. But without church membership, that's like, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's the first, it's like, it's, it's like uh, t- launching a rocket and having the propulsion, but not having anybody to guide the rocket. Like it gets off the ground and then it doesn't know where it's going and it crashes back down. You need that decision, but you need church to guide it. Marilyn? If you've ever been a part of the crusade, we've, we've been a part of it numerous times, but they always had the people who were there at the front mm. to encourage them to join a church, and there were specific churches yeah. in the whole area mm. who were preparing to be the ones to Mm. get these people grounded in a Bible church. I'm glad you said it. I didn't, I didn't realize so, that. I That's mean, good. 6% of all the millions It's still a lot. Still, yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, so I hope you don't hear me saying Billy Graham and the Revival of Crusades are bad. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this is the need for church membership. Like if all we ever did was Billy Graham crusade, and Billy Graham would, would not say this. He would say, go to church, become a member. But, but the point is, you know, if all we ever did were these revival crusades without church membership, we wouldn't have a church. We'd have all these people coming forward and then it would fizzle. So you need both. Like, I, you know, hey, if, Bill, Bill, if what's his name, Franklin Graham, I think is his son, if he wants to come and do a revival, I'd be like, come on, let's go. But I'm also going to say without church membership, we're just we're wasting our time. I think Billy Graham would say the same 
same exact thing. So um, when it comes to being a member, what are some biblical reasons for why we should be a member of the church? This is, this, this is, as far as I've seen, this has gone in two stages, the rejection of this. First, you know, when I was younger, people said, I don't, I don't think membership is worth it. I just want to attend. I don't want to become a member. I don't think I should do that. That was 15 years ago. That was a big conversation. Now, what are people saying? Does anybody care about that? No. What are people debating? Not whether you should become a member at church, but whether you should even go to church. Exactly. Why should I even show up? And so in my mind, I see, I see a progression there where, you know, 15 years ago we were saying, ah, membership, not that important. Now, 15 years later, we're saying, just showing up and going, not that, not that, that important. Way you get out of the yeah, you don't have to tithe. You don't have to become a, you don't have to serve. You don't have elders bothering you because we haven't seen you in two months and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So what are some biblical um, reasons for church membership. Uh, I want to look at a couple key texts. A key text um, is Matthew 18. This is where Jesus gives the prescription, not a suggestion, the prescription for dealing with uh, problems in the church. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 12. Jesus says, What do you think if any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have gone, not gone astray. So it is the will of your Father who is in heaven that, one, that not one of these little ones perish. Okay, so Jesus says um, the, the people in the church are the sheep. He says, what's a good shepherd do? You know, he's speaking in the vernacular of the people who were listening. They were shepherds. If this was today, it might be, uh, I mean, if it was your parents' generation, it might be, you know, what good um, uh, dairy farmer has 10 dairy cows and one dairy cow goes straying off and he just says, oh, don't, don't worry about it. You'd say that's a terrible dairy farmer, right? That's what Jesus is trying to say. Today, it might be, I don't know, what, what kind of person has stocks and you lose 25% of your stocks and you say, oh, don't worry about it. I don't care. Right? You're going to care. You're going to. And so Jesus said, what kind of shepherd loses a, someone who strays off and says, oh, don't, don't worry about it. And so he says, here's, here's what you do in verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. So, you know, you've got these sheep, they're bickering, they're fighting. And, you know, one, one person in the church says to, to Frank, hey, Frank, I don't like your tie today. I think you should not come to church anymore. And Frank says, well, that's really mean. I really like this tie. My grandma gave it to me. And so they're having this fight. And so Frank, Frank is supposed to go to, to Joe, or Frank's supposed to go to Ralph, who insulted his tie, and say, hey, Ralph, that wasn't nice. I'm, you shouldn't have insulted me like that. That hurt my feelings. Well, Frank says, I don't care if you, your feelings were hurt. That tie is incredibly ugly. Get out of here, right? Well, then what's supposed to happen? But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you. So by the, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So now uh, Frank is, uh, or Ralph is supposed to, I'm probably forgetting who's who. <laughs> Ralph is supposed to go get a friend. And say, hey, look what Frank is doing to me. Look how mean Frank is to me, friend. And then if Frank, if Frank looks at those two and says, now you have two witnesses saying what I'm doing is wrong. I still don't care. I'm still going to tell you your tie is ugly. Get out of here. Then what happens? If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And even if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Okay, that's the third stage. Then when... Ralph brings his friend, and Frank still says, I don't care. Then it's the church. So this is church government, right? Uh, we're, we're in here in Artesia first. Frank's sitting there. Ralph comes up and says, I don't like your tie. They bicker about it. And then the first step is not go to the pastor. The first step is get another one, another friend. So Ralph gets, goes to his friend and says, hey, can you help me with this? We're all prophets, priests, and kings. Brother, sister, can you help me with this? Let's sit down with Frank and talk to him. And Frank says, you know, I don't care what you two people say. I'm still going to be belligerent. Then at that stage, the elders come in and the elders say, Frank, if you don't quit it, uh, we are going to tell the whole church and we're going to bar you from 
membership. That's what Jesus means when he says, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector, right? Gentiles and tax collectors to the Jews were persona non grata. They weren't in fellowship together. So here we see in Matthew 18, Jesus commanding and directing uh, church discipline. Okay, you only get two questions, so this will be your second. You want to, you want to spend it? Is it possible uh, repentance of the restoration of membership? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. So, uh, so we need to go now to that other passage that Joe mentioned earlier. So Jesus does it, and then he moves on to talk about something else after this. But we see there the, the, the working structure of church membership. Jesus describes kind of the bare bones of what church membership should look like in Matthew 18. And then we see this uh, in different places in the New Testament. Okay. Here's, here's an aside that's going to help us read the Bible and understand this at the same time. This is really important. The Bible is not written like a systematic theology textbook. The Bible is not like, here's a chapter on church discipline. That's not the way the Bible is written. Systematic theology textbooks are written like that. The books I read in seminary are written like that. Here's a whole chapter on church membership. The Bible is written in a different way. The Bible is a, is a document that's written for ongoing situations in the New Testament, right? So Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were doing something bad or good or whatever. So he's responding to that situation. He's not sitting down and writing a systematic theology textbook. He's responding to certain events going on. Why is that relevant? So when we're trying to figure out what the Bible says about church discipline, we don't go to the chapter on church discipline because it's not written that way. We look at the whole Bible and see where are the things in the Bible that we can glean that speak to church discipline. Okay, so that's why we look at Matthew 18. We see, okay, here's some stuff about church discipline. Then there was another situation with Paul, and he was dealing with church discipline in that situation. So let's look at that. That's, I think that's 2 Corinthians 5. So this is a um, kind of a famous case. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's First Corinthians five. Okay, so there's the story in one of the Corinthians where there's a man having relations with his mother-in-law, and they have to purge that man from the church. Anybody know where that is? Oh, I thought it was with his stepmother. Yeah, isn't that? What did I say? First Corinthians. Yeah. First Corinthians five. Thank you. Okay, I really gotta clean these notes up. I got way too much stuff in here. Okay, sorry. So so Paul deals with a similar situation, right? He's got he's got now again, he's not writing a systematic theology textbook, he's responding to a specific situation. And so what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, the people in the Bible already knew this stuff, and so they were dealing with their situation. And what we're doing is we're looking at how they dealt with the situation in order to figure out how we deal with the situation. That's a little bit different than the people in the Bible were writing a systematic theology textbook. They didn't write a whole chapter on church discipline. They just knew this stuff and they were living it out. And now we're kind of like imitating them. How did they live this out? And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says um, that there's this person in their midst If you look at uh, chapter 5, verse 9, it says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or or covetous or an idolater or viler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Okay, so Paul says, be friends with worldly drunkards. Be friends with them. But if it's a worldly drunkard who's claiming to be a Christian, well, then the elders better do their jobs and go up to this guy and say, hey, if you keep continuing this lifestyle, we're going to have to um, bar you from membership. Okay, so that's the specific situation. Hmm. I'm, I'm okay. So now, 1 Corinthians 11, a little bit later on in the book, Paul starts talking about how this kind of works out. Um, 
And he says, in verse 27, chapter 11, verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. So you need to examine yourself, right? So he's saying, if you're taking communion, make sure you really believe this stuff. Um, and then he says, man, I'm sorry, I'm unprepared today. There's some place where he says, you're going to purge this person, hand him over to Satan. I can't find it. Hand him over to Satan so that hopefully he will be sifted by Satan and redeemed at the end. I can't find it right now. Somewhere in this book, Paul says that. So to answer your question, Paul sees this situation. How does he deal with it? How does he deal with this guy who's having an incestuous relationship? Well, he says, we're going to bar him from the table. He's not going to take communion. We're going to distinguish him from us. And basically, we're going to say, hey, brother, you are identifying yourself as the world. I'm friends with sinners. I'm friends with drunkards. We can be friends, but we are not going to identify you with the body of Christ. The goal there being this person now says, oh, no, I'm outside of the church. I need to repent in order to be uh, uh, brought back into the church. So the, the goal there, to answer Joe's question, Really important. The goal there is ultimately the salvation of that person. It's almost exactly like a doctor going to a patient saying, you have something, you have cancer, we got to cut this out. That's what the elders are doing to the body of Christ. They're saying there's cancer here, we got to cut this out. It would be a bad doctor if he said, don't worry about that cancer, just, just, it's fine. Don't worry about Frank, he's being his wife and getting drunk, don't worry about it, just, it's fine. That's a bad doctor. A good doctor says, this is a problem, we got to cut it out. And the goal is cutting out that bad thing, ministering to that person, treating the person as an unbeliever, saying we want you to become a Christian, hopefully so that 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 person will become saved. Okay, so that's the core of church membership. The core of church membership is identifying who is a believer, and that's really important because we can't, uh, uh, it's hard to be saved by Christ if we don't know who a believer is. So if, if I'm an average, uh, uh, I guess that's the right word, you know, a lay Christian, I'm not in ministry, I'm, I'm a layman, what's the best thing that I can do in order to follow Christ? Well, it's to come to the church and say, I would like to be a member, please. I would like to be submitted under the authority of the elders, and I would like you to have spiritual oversight over me so that if I really start going outside of the bounds, you'll... you'll do something about it. I want you to lead me spiritually. That's, that's the, the response that a Christian should have to the church, right? I, you, we should read 1 Corinthians and say, I want that to be able to happen to me. If I start having an incestuous relationship, I want the elders to bar me from this. Like, I want that. So it, sound, it might sound at first like, oh, this is really bad. This is really negative. But really, this is, this is the only way for us to have true spiritual life is to have people brothers and sisters in our lives who are who are um, we're accountable to why is that well if we go back to this class predestination I remember that the what's the t and tulip stand for total depravity. total depravity that does that apply to us before we become christians or does it apply before and after we become christians yeah, both. We still are totally depraved, all of us, which is why the Reformed say we don't have a pope because the pope is totally depraved. There's never one guy in charge. It's always Jesus and then the church because we're totally depraved. So because we all have that tendency, we all need to keep each other accountable, right? The, the Reformed have no church where it's like, oh, there's this pastor who's in charge and everybody kind of works for the pastor. We don't have that. Why? Because it's total depravity. So I, I am a member of this church submitted to the elders, right? I'm on the elder board. I'm actually the president of the elder board, but I'm also submitted to the elders. If, if the elders are like, Rob, you're getting drunk and beating your wife, they will excommunicate me just like anybody else. We all are submitted to that, and that's a big gift to us all. Hey, no, they can hang out in here. We're almost done. You guys can hang out here if you want. Go with Grandpa Leo. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. I want to ask you a question regarding being a Christian who accept Jesus Christ as the Savior, um, become a member. Uh -huh. As a Christian, we still commit mistakes. 
put it that way. Mistake. Yeah, yeah. As a member, there is no different. Which one are the one that separate you? Which one are the bigger? Yeah, uh, good question, good question. So the question is, and this is a good question, because we might be getting a little nervous. We're like, uh-oh. Can anybody be a member of the church? I sin all the time. Are the elders going to kick me out? Right? We might be thinking that. What, what are the big sins? What are the kick you out of church type of sins? Okay, so there isn't, a, there isn't like a list where we say like, uh, th- you, could, you could literally murder somebody and still, become, still be a member of the church. There's, there is no... What's that? Yeah, well, when it comes to church membership and the elders, uh, the elders can only do what they're humanly capable of doing. So we can't read minds, we can't read hearts. And so what the elders are responsible for doing is making a determination as best as they can of who wants to be a Christian and who doesn't, right? So Frank, who's beating his wife and getting drunk all the time, he might say he wants to be a Christian, but if over and over and over again, after warning, after warning, after warning, we're like, hey, man, this is not, you're not following Christ. And if he's like, I don't care what you say, I'm going to live my life. Well, then we'd say, in, in, our, in our determination, this man is choosing to not follow Christ. Even though he says with his lips he is, he's choosing not to. And so to protect the church and to protect the name of Christ, we're going to bar him from uh, membership. But in terms of a list or which sins or our thought sins... Elders, we, we can't. We, what, a, what about if some Christian that they are not member or member, they come and say, listen, pastor, or listen, the other member, okay, I'm doing this. Help me. It still will be out? No. Good question. So if, the, if Frank comes up to the elders and he says, I beat my wife last night and got drunk, Then the elders will say, thank you for coming to us. Let us bring you to the cross where you can receive forgiveness of Christ and let us shepherd you and walk with you in sobriety and peace with your wife. So there would be no barring from membership there because the person is is doing what all Christians do, doing what I do and all the elders do. We all sin and we ask for forgiveness. That's why we do confession every single Sunday because we all go through that process. So membership is all about... Is this person sinning and repenting? There's only two options. Is this person sinning and repenting, or is this person just sinning? That's really all the elders are trying to do. Is it sin and repentance? That's every single member in the church. Or is it sin, I'm not repenting, I'm sticking with this sin? What about if a Christian, as a member, uh, uh, there is an incident between them, like disrespectful, like, you know, Well, hold on a sec. So we're running out of time. We'll, we'll talk about the specific things when we talk personally, because there's a lot of specific situations. You're, you're right. There's a lot of what about this and that. And so we'll get to all that when we talk together. So every person who's going to become a member, you're going to have a personal conversation with me and the elders or multiple. So we'll talk about individual things like that. But the main point that I want to uh, get across is that um, this is the memberships for the health of the church, and um, and it's not about uh, not being. It's not about being sinless. We expect that all of us are going to sin, but it's just um, ensuring that we're Christians who are repenting of our sin. Okay. Rob. Yes, sir. Well, yes and no, because if you look at that list, let's say, let's, you know, homosexuality is a big one, right? Let's say somebody, somebody who says, I struggle with the sin of homosexuality, but I repent of it and I don't want to live that lifestyle. No, I'm talking about that, but without repentance. I mean, it kind of gives you a feel for the type of sin. Right. 
Well, yeah, the, the, but there, it could be any sin, you know. A- any sin somebody's committing, if someone's saying, I'm going to choose this sin and reject Christ, well, then the elders, the elders' job, first and foremost, is to say, hey, brother or sister, this is, some, this is a place in your life where you can surrender to Christ. Let's do that. Let's surrender this to Christ. Let's grow. But, you know, if the person continues to reject the elders, they're ultimately rejecting Christ. And at some point down the road, a year later, the elders may have to say, hey, we think we, we need to bar you. Okay, so um, again, like I said, membership, the core, of membership, the core of membership is who's in or who's out. But there's a lot of other things, right? One is just being kind of um, uh, signing a covenant saying, I, am, um, I care what the elders say about my life. Right? I care um, if the elders come up to me and say, hey, you've been coming to church once a month and we'd like to encourage you to come more frequently, you'll take that to heart and listen to them instead of, that's your opinion, man, I don't care. Like, you can, you know, like this, this kind of looking to the elders and the pastor as like, this person can help guide me to Christ. So that's one thing. Another thing is it's being involved in the church in such a way that you're um, now capable of serving the church, like we said later. So you can be on a committee and things like that. So there's... there's um, Membership, who's in, who's out, submitting to the elders, being on a committee. There's all these facets of membership, but they all kind of... Um, at least, uh, uh, not, not at least, because everything is the same, but at least the one can put you differently before excluding you completely. Yeah, so again, I, there is no pat, like, here's how excluding somebody from membership works. Um it's, but it, it never occurs in a shorter time period than at least a year. And it's because, it, why? Because we're going to sit and meet with the person and say, hey, we saw this, please stop, we're begging you, please stop. And they say no. And then we meet and we ask them again and again and again. And after the fourth or fifth or sixth time, we bring in other people to say, will you please talk to them? Will you please talk to them? We call the wife and we call you know, whoever. And after all of these times, at some point, the elders make a decision. But there is no... No, he can still, we, we would say, hey, we're barring you from membership, but as long as he's not a physical threat, like if he's coming and like beating people up, we're going to say no. But if he's, if he's we're going to invite him and say, please come back, please hear the word preached. We can't give you communion, but please hear the word preached. Please worship God. Please continue to come. And we're going to pray earnestly that this man will one day say, God, I repent of my sin. Please, please forgive me, and then we'll bring him back into the church. Okay, so last thing I want to read, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I think that perfectly encapsulates, that verse encapsulates church membership. This is what church membership is all about. Be submissive to the elders, Clothe yourselves with humility. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This should be a humble interaction from sinner to sinner, whether it's pastor, elder, deacon, layperson. We're all sinners. There is no rank structure. One person isn't above another person, but it's it's this uh, loving relationship clothed with humility, such humility that we're willing to say, hey, elders, I want you to lead me. You know, and so when we do that, the Bible promises that the church will be healthy. This is for the health of the church. Healthy churches look this way. Healthy churches have people who say, hey, lead me, guide me. Uh, and uh, this is for our own personal health. We will be the most healthy spiritually as individuals if we're willing to look to the elders and say, hey, I'm okay with you leading me. That will produce a lot of spiritual health. The least spiritually healthy people are know-it-alls who say, I don't need anybody. I've got all the answers. I don't need church. Those people are like spiritually impoverished. But really healthy people are, you know, the Bible says the healthiest people are people who see that they're like children. That's why Jesus says, to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. We're like, I need help. Please help me. Feed me. Guide me. Lead me. If, if we're that kind of people, if the church is that way, we will be spiritually healthy as individuals and the church will be healthy. One more thing, and then we got to close. Yeah, I, you know, I um, previously never uh, saw the value of church membership, and then I started seeing all these people go off the rails, you know, and 
nobody doing anything about it. And what it, it, I see it as so important that uh, that I would wish that all churches did this because what a lot of people do is they get into some sort of trouble and they meet with the elders and they just oh I'm just going to go down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And then they go down the street and they're so happy to have a new member. Yeah. Nobody does any background check. Yep. They do nothing and they just escape the whole point of doing this and it's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about that after. I want to respect everybody's no, time. About well, okay. We'll we'll t- we'll talk about it after. We we're over time. We got to close. Okay. So the thing I want you to leave you with: membership is good for you. I, it's sanctification or sadism. It sounds bad at first, but when you think about it and realize it, it's actually for your good, for your health, for the health of the church. And it's such a blessing that the way one of the ways that God. One of the ways we can serve God is just by saying, I want to be a member. I want to be sub- subject to the elders. Like, that's actually serving God. You're actually, like, doing a spiritual work by being a member, following the elders. Like, that, how gracious is God that that's actually a work? Like, that's something good that you will receive a reward for in heaven. By being a member, all you got to do, you know, it's just, that's God's grace. It's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. It sounds bad, but it's really good. We can talk more after. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your church. We thank you for membership. We pray that you'd help us to, all of us, myself included, the elders and deacons included, help us all to be uh, 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 willing members uh, who are submissive to one another, including me. Help us to be submissive to one another and use church membership to cause us to grow as individuals and the church as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.